Some of you may receive material from over the internet and your email that's called, it's from the Patriot Post. It's called the Patriot Post Digest. And usually it puts out something every day. It's quite conservative. And as the name suggests, it's interested in patriotism. But it's also interested in biblical morals. And it has some interesting things sometimes to say about uh, the Bible and the study of it. Back on uh, July the 7th, 2006, there was an article that I would like to read part of it to you. I think you'll find it interesting. It'll form the rest of our study. It begins by, Judge not, lest ye be judged. It's notable, the article begins, that this text from the Bible has replaced John 3.16. And you're familiar with that one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He says here, the writer, that it has replaced John 3.16 as Americans' favorite scriptural quotation. But what does it actually mean? Is this ageless admonition, that is, judge not, lest you be judged, really a call to unmitigated tolerance over discernment between right and wrong? Is it really a biblical nod of the head to the virtues of postmodern morality, which means there's no standard whatsoever, because you can't even tell what a standard is. Each person is on standard. And multicultural society, which means a society that allows for whatever postmodernism teaches. Then his response is, of course not. As Christ's imperative against judgment appears in the gospel accounts, a different picture emerges. With the Pharisees clearly in view in the Sermon on the Mount account of Matthew chapter 7, and again in Luke chapter 6, judge not appears in the context of the proverbial man who perceives the speck that is in his brother's eye, but not the log or the beam that is in his own. The context then suggests a warning against hypocrisy, not moral discernment. Indeed, the full imperative of the passage encourages righteous judgment. Notice, first take the beam out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the motor speck out of your brother's eye. Then in John chapter 7, verse 24, the article goes on. Taking aim at the Pharisees once again, <clears throat> Jesus makes another extraordinary statement. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So, does Jesus really call his followers to judge not? Not really. In the vocabulary of theologians, this practice of isolating and thereby misinterpreting a phrase or passage from its context is called isogesis. Now that simply means reading into the text for whatever reason, use your likes, dislikes, opinions, or what somebody else thought, reading into the text, isogesis, what is not there, what God did not put into it. Other common examples, he goes on to write, of isogesis, which we'll leave to your own exegesis, which means to lead out of the passage only what God put into it. Include the imperative, care for orphans and widows, James 1, to sanction social and thereby governmental responsibility, but of course not ours. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for the man, 1 Corinthians 11, as an affirmation of male chauvinism. 
And love keeps no record of wrongs, 1 Corinthians 13, as a get-out-of-jail-free card for habitual sin. Which shows that people take passages out of their context, reading into them what they want, and make them say whatever they want. This is the reason some people say, as I interrupt the article here for a moment, that you can take the Bible prove anything with it. Well, you can if you mishandle it. You have instruction, let's remember, from Paul that in studying the scriptures, which is a must, it's an imperative for us, but it's also a must, an imperative, that we handle a right or right, divide the word of truth. And that implies you can handle it wrongly. So it shows us how you must properly handle the word of truth when you say rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, I go back now. And the title of the article in which these comments appeared was not specifically dealing with a biblical point. The title is Constitutional Isogesis. Now, what would somebody do all that about the Bible and yet apply it to the interpretation of the U.S. Constitution? Because they're documents in languages and they're written the same way and the same rules govern all of them. The same rules of interpretation. How to get out exactly what the writers or the Constitution said. You'll employ the exact same principles of interpretation to it that you would to the Bible to ascertain the authority of Christ and the words of the New Testament. Okay, the point of the article was that, and he says this, the same fallacies that affect biblical interpretation also affect our interpretation of the Constitution. Now here's the conclusion of the article. I quote again. Just as the problem of biblical constitutional isogesis is essentially the same, so too is the solution. For centuries, a fundamental guiding principle has directed proper scriptural exogesis. That is, making sure you get out of it and only what God put into those words because you don't want to read into it your will. You're after God's will. Scripture, and this is the summation of it, a lot of details in this, he says Scripture interprets Scripture. That is fundamentally what we want to do. He goes ahead. That is to say the primary lens, L-E-N-S, lens for understanding a text is the text elsewhere in the Bible. Thus, we will say something like this. Don't begin to do your reasoning to draw the conclusion that you'll know what God's will is until you've taken what all the Bible has to say on it before you begin to do that. And so many times when you study all the Bible has to say on a matter, wherever those passages are in their immediate environment or context and then how they're used elsewhere, then you're going to have the wherewithal to do it. But you know that does take time. It does take interest. It does take a concern to be right with God and to study His Word. And when you have a day and age when people won't hardly pick up the Bible to read it, then this is really asking a lot of folks. But of course, when you consider there's two places we go when we die, heaven or hell, and no in between, it seems to me that ought to be enough to say you ought to be serious about Bible study and ascertaining the Lord's will for our lives. Now, the author of the article is constitutionally and politically conservative, but he's not a member of the Lord's church. He's not what the Bible defines to be a Christian. However, I think you will agree with me, if you know anything about things like this at all, have any interest in them, that the article testifies to the fact that uh, some people who are not Christians understand better how to properly interpret the Constitution than they do the New Testament, and if they would use the proper tools of interpreting a document like the Constitution when they come to the interpretation of a document, a last will and testament, which is the New Testament, then they would ascertain a lot more about that. It just goes to show you that in one area you can do what you ought to do, but when it needs to be applied, the same thing in another area, you may flounder for whatever reason. But the point made is, is that people, whether it's the Constitution or the New Testament, 
can follow so-called rules and regulations that don't lead out only what God put in his word for us to know, but we can engage in eisegesis when it comes to the word of God or the Constitution or for that matter, any other document uh, such as uh, agreements and contracts and things like that. So we do not want to be found isolating a phrase or a passage from its context and just simply reading into it what suits us, what is our like or dislike. And that's a danger for every one of us because I like things. I dislike things. How strong is your opinion on your likes and dislikes? Uh, we know how strong it was with the Pharisees who did not do what they did because they desired to break God's law. In fact, everything they did was supposedly a protection of God's law. Herein lies a great danger. For some people, in their zeal to protect the Word of God, to protect Christian living, to protect the church as it appears on the pages of the New Testament, will end up trying to do one better than God in making laws for him or even in their interpretation of the actual text of the scriptures. And you know what happens? This simply results in misinterpretation. Such conservative uh, people also know and recognize obviously here the proper practice of rules of interpretation so we can lead out of the words in a passage only what God put into them. And this is what we must do in rightly dividing the word of truth. It's what we must do in obeying the commandment, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 So this is fundamentally the view that Scripture interprets Scripture that we're interested in today. We lead out of the text only what God put into it. I say again, this takes some time. It takes a thorough knowledge of the Bible. And that doesn't come but one way, and that is getting into the study of it. This is the correct way to examine whatever scripture it is that we're studying in order to come to a correct understanding of a scripture. And I don't know why anybody wants to study anything that don't get the correct understanding of it. Think about that for a minute. And of course, this is especially true when it comes down to judge not lest ye be judged, Matthew 7, 1. What we need to learn, and it's sort of like division. People many times talk about division in the New Testament. It's always wrong. Well, they don't know what the Bible says on all of it. Listen, there is a division that is authorized by the New Testament. There is a division that is condemned and not authorized by the New Testament. Well, there is a judgment that God condemns. And there is a judgment that he has commanded. The judgment God condemns, in the light of what we've already said from the article I read to you, is hypocritical judgment. There is no way we can get through hardly a minute without making some sort of decision about something. And that's a judgment on our part. And when we make a judgment in mundane matters, we still want to be correct. Let's take a recipe, for example. Now, recipes are such that people who are good cooks can alter recipes and make them maybe more like they want. But if you're going to follow strictly a recipe somebody gave you because you ate what they produced when they follow it, and you just loved it, and you want to create what they did, you won't deviate from that recipe. You want to get out of the recipe the words that comprise it, only what they mean. And if it says a half a teaspoon of salt, you do not put a cup. Well, you can. And when you do something that glaring, everybody will know you did when they taste of it. And that is, of course, a blatant mistake, but it serves to illustrate what I'm talking about. Those who condemn, and by the way, many times the word judge is used in the scriptures to mean condemned. Those who condemn others for judging, uh, we said this many times, it's beyond me. I've stood amazed at it all my life. I judge you to be wrong because you judged. Now, let me see. You're practicing on me that which you say is sinful in me, and you do it without sinning. 
And that's what happens. Because all of us make judgments. All of us weigh whatever evidence we have. Maybe not much. But somewhere or the other, we all come to a conclusion about something or somebody. And that's a judgment. So those who condemn or judge others for judging engage in the judgment our Lord said not to do. The very ones who want to misuse, judge not, lest ye be judged, end up doing what the Lord condemned. That's rather amazing. The very thing they're trying to stop, they do. Now, now listen to Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaking. Judge not. Let ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that's in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Now the Lord, not David Brown. I agree with the Lord, but he still teaches the truth whether I agree with him or not. He says a fellow that does this, in no uncertain terms, doesn't take but two words, very positive, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Notice, he said, if you want to be a judge like you need to be a judge, seeing that you must judge, then put yourself in the right position to be a righteous judge. That's all he's saying. And you are not in that position if you have something there hindering your, to follow the illustration, Hindering your ability to see a very small speck in somebody else's life. So the judgment that God has commanded then is righteous judgment. You know, we emphasize so much whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father thereby, Colossians 3.17. You know why we emphasize that? Because... To be right with God, you must have Bible authority behind all your beliefs and all your actions. Well, won't that cover judgment, which is an action, mental action? Shouldn't we then have Bible authority behind our arriving at our mental thoughts and then the actions derived from those thoughts? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, and remember the heart's the inner man, it's the real you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if you're going to utter a judgment, it's coming out of the abundance of your heart. Now we're to have Bible authority coming from the word of Christ, which we must rightly divide, so that we can make a proper pronouncement. For example, very simple. A person says, well, I'm a Christian. Well, okay. That's fine if you are. Have you been immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sin? No. I was saved before I was baptized. You think I'm going to make a judgment in the light of the right and divided word of God whether that person's a Christian or not? Well, of course I am. And I want that person to do the same thing for himself. Well, I'm going to heaven. That's all well and good. Are you ready to go to heaven? Have you prepared yourself to go to heaven? Are you right with God? Have your sins been forgiven? Are you reconciled to God? Are you a member of His blood-bought church? Well, no, I don't think you have to be a member of any church. Now, what am I going to conclude from that, being that I know what my Lord's will is on the matter? Because every person who is baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, the Lord added to His church, Acts 2, verse 47. So if a person is telling me I'm going to heaven but I'm not a member of any church, I know he's wrong. And I want to get him to see the totality of what the New Testament of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and eventually our judge is going or has done, has already concluded in the Scriptures. You know, that's a point to be kept in mind. When we're preaching the gospel, we're not 
shaping and making the gospel were preach the Lord's judgment on matters. It's already done. The Lord has already decided who is a Christian or what it takes to become a Christian and who's not. Who's a faithful member of the church and who's not. He's already decided it and he's already put it down in his book. So when you go out and preach, if you preach with the right disposition of heart to preach the Lord's will to save souls, then what do you preach? Well, I know what Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, as he wrote part of the last will and testament of Christ, said to that young preacher Timothy, and thus to everyone, preach the word. Whose word? What word? Where is it found? Why the word? Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Now, you're not creating something of your own desires. You're presenting that which the Lord a long time ago revealed and set down in words. And the words the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. And you can't have the kingdom where the word is not planted, and the word is planted in the minds of hearts of men. And they are saved when they understand in their hearts what the will of God is. Compare and contrast their life with what the will of God is. And in the light of the truth, knowing that all have sinned, and sin's the transgression of the law, John 6, 23, 1 John 3, 4, and they're separated from God by that sin, and sin's the only thing that can condemn them and separate them from God. And lo and behold, they learn that they must be baptized for the remission of sins, then that ought to make them think very seriously about what the Bible teaches in its totality on when exactly one has remission of sin. And the Lord decided that a long time ago. I don't have to decide it. I simply must re research the word where it's found and understand it. And therefore, I cannot afford to isogete it. I'm interested in leading out of it only what God put into it by the proper rules of understanding language. You know then that Christians are commanded to judge. You cannot be faithful. Well, first of all, you cannot even become a Christian without judging. As a Christian, to be faithful and in your dealings with your brothers and sisters in Christ or anybody else, you must judge. It's not I will or I won't. You will, so why don't you do it like the Bible said? Because you're going to judge. Listen to what is said. In 1 Corinthians 6, 2 through 3, by the Apostle Paul. He's asking the brethren this. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Well, what does that do to a false uh, understanding of judge not according to, or rather judge not lest you be judged? What does that do to that? If you take a view that says no judging at all, which meant you had to judge and conclude that you shouldn't judge, which doesn't make sense. That's what's called an absurdity. <laughs> But here it's obvious Paul, by the same Holy Spirit that guided everybody else because he's revealing the mind of Christ now that Christ is at the right hand of God ruling after he sent him back to heaven and he's giving us his last will and testament. Paul, by the Holy Spirit, said, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Well, ask yourself that question. If you're a member of the Lord's church, ask yourself that question. What answer are you going to give? Because he says, And if the world shall be judged by you, you who? Members of the church. Are ye unworthy to judge the smallest things? Talking about matters among you pertaining to living the Christian life and the lives of those who make up the church. Then notice, know ye not, and I have to say something, I know they don't know. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Now I frankly admit, I don't know what all that means, but I know it's exercising a judgment on the part of Christians regarding angels. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Now his point is, if we're going to judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? Again, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. What's the, what's the whole passage teaching, these two verses? What is the import of it? Proper judgment, and that you're obligated to do it as a part of your faithfulness to the Lord, and you members are to do it. There's a proper way to do it. And there's a wrong way to do it. So you can't be faithful to God and not exercise judgment. And God expects it of you, John 7, 24, and 1 Corinthians 6, 2, 3. So it's a strange thing to me that people will just yank Matthew 7, 1 right out of its environment, its context, and say, see, 
No judging whatsoever. How many times on television program have I seen situations where somebody says, well, I'm one of the least judgmental people in the world, which means you don't live any way you want to live. And I'll say, whoopie do, if that suits you, that suits me. Well, now, I don't quite think so. You might want to knock me in the head and take my money, and that doesn't suit me. And you'll find out quickly it doesn't suit you if I get a chance. And that's a judgment I'll make <laughs> on the basis of the wrong judgment you made. You can't live without making judgment. So why not receive the instruction of the Lord on righteous judgment and set your mind on doing it? So we're not to judge on the basis of our own desires. Folks, I've seen members of the church who didn't know the difference in their own desires and the will of heaven. They just don't. We often joke about it, but it's serious. Say, David Brown 238. What do we mean when we say that? Well, it doesn't mean David Brown in 238 pistols. It could at times, wherever I am, might mean that and a whole lot more, but not in the example I'm giving. What we're saying is, he's his own authority, and he's going to make it work for himself no matter what. Are there people like that? Make a judgment and give me an answer. Shake or nod. <laughs> there are people like that. They sure are. And they're so bent on having things their way, they're not going to receive the evidence that's credible to make their mind up. So we dare not. Rely on our desires, our likes, our dislikes, our opinions, our preferences. In other words, our individual assessment without the revelation of God found in His Word to draw our conclusions about anything or anybody. When we judge, and let me say this, and judge we will do. Even if you say, well, I won't judge, it's made one. We are to judge on the basis of God's standard. Now, that's a challenge to train yourself to make no judgment except by the authority of the Lord. That is, as the New Testament says, we ought to see things. Remember, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1.25. What does that mean? It means you let God's right divided word be your guide in every thought, word, and action that you can fulfill Colossians 3.17 where we're to do all things by his authority, so that you can make proper judgment. Now, our Lord knows that. I said earlier, that's his will we're to go by. But I'll use another passage that's most uh, common to us. Anybody that studies the Bible or is interested in New Testament Christianity, it's the words of our Lord as John records them in John chapter 12 and verse 48. Why did our Lord say this? He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. Hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Can I determine who's going to be saved on the day of judgment? I sure can. Well, are you some way able to see the future? Only through the eye of faith. Since faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 17 and Paul says that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. That is, as things appear to our five senses. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And I'm to have God's authority through His Son as set out in His New Testament, the words of the New Testament, guiding me in my perception and understanding of all things, religious and moral and any other thing then out obviously he thinks I can know his will about who's a Christian today and whether I am or I'm not, what the church is and its work, its organization and its worship, the difference in human institutions that are religious and in the Lord's singular institution that he built, purchased with his own precious blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. He gives me the, you know, I never did have to go out here and, 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 and just develop the idea of being rational. You can't do that. You're born that way. You have the mechanism of rationality. You have the mechanism of intellect. It's all connected together. If you want to think of it like a computer, your intellect is where you feed information in. And you've got that rational power of the intellect reasoning with the information and draw a conclusion. <laughs> Sometimes with some people, and I'm afraid too many people, it's garbage in, garbage out. 
But that's not the way God intended. God gave us that wherewithal. Now, he also gave us a will. That means I can choose, I can do, I can reject, I can refuse. I can know the truth and reject the truth because I don't want it. That's what the chief Jews did to Jesus. Jesus proved he was the Son of God. They didn't care. Did you notice the, the reading a while ago? You know, what, shall you take Barabbas or, or will you take Christ? What am I going to Pilate is saying, I don't want to make the decision, but I'll tell you what I think about him. He's innocent. Now, what was the response of the Jews? Crucify him. Pilate, will you? And ask them, what evil hath he done? I even said, I don't find any, any fault in him. Crucify him. In other words, it doesn't make any difference about the facts of the case. We want him dead, and dead we will have him. This old saying comes up, you know, I got my mind made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. There are a lot of people like that. We joke about that too. But a lot of us are like that. I want this to be this way. And don't give me evidence speaking to the contrary. You know why? Because it makes me have to take positions that are unpleasant to me. And I don't like it. Some of us are like the old fellow long years ago that was reputed to get along with everybody. It made a difference. He got along with everybody. And uh, everybody liked him. Nobody spoke evil of him. He just, you know, fine as far as everybody. And somebody said, uh, Joe, you've got this long reputation of just getting along with everybody and you have no enemies. Can you tell us the secret of being able to get along with everybody and everybody happy with you and you're friends of everybody and nobody speaks ill of you? Can you tell us how that? He says, oh, yes, sir. He said, I just go wherever they push me. Some of us are not disposed to have that disposition. Well, that's awful arrogant of you. Let me say two words and see if that gives you any key to why I might hold that view. Jesus Christ. Do you think of him as a milk toast pushed any way anybody wanted to go so he could have peace at any price? I don't, and your Bible doesn't reveal him that way. And the body of Christ ought to be composed of people who will take up their cross daily and follow him. As we sang, we would in the song a while ago, and as the scripture stated before the song was ever written. So we must be mindful of these kind of things because the word of God that he's already given and has been here in his complete form for almost 2,000 years for mankind to study will read the same way on the day of what? Judgment. When each one of us, all by ourselves, come to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, as Paul said in Romans, to give account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. I already know the standard of judgment. It's right here. That's going to be it. It, it will not change. Man may try to change it. It won't change. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word won't. When we say that the Bible says we're not speaking from our own bias or with favoritism or our likes or dislikes, opinions and the like, we're saying that God's word's there and man can know it without altering it, without handicapping it, without misunderstanding it, when he sets his mind objectively and honestly to learn how to ascertain the truth of a document like this. Daniel Denham wrote this. I quote, Those who do not want to be judged are those who do not want the light to expose the dark in their life. John 3.19 he quotes. And this is the condemnation. Jesus speaking of course. That light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. Again John 3.19. He goes ahead to quote in the Old Testament. The same problem with mankind. Brought out by the great prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 30 and verse 10. They were saying in their day. Which say to the seers see not. And to the prophets prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. He goes ahead to write. Here we find people that did not want God's truth spoken. They want nice things. Smooth things. They did not want anyone saying the truth. They only wanted the niceties. So too are those today. And they get mad when the truth of God's word spoken. They tell those quoting the Bible to stop judging. They only want 
to hear pleasantries and not the truth. Well, what more can I say than I've said? It's there in the Bible to begin with. I just brought it out. Everybody here, I think, acknowledges this is the Word of God. Well, if it is, and we're creatures of God, then God's communicated to us. And He expects us to follow His will, making whatever adjustments in our lives that we must in order to be obedient to His will. And let us ever remember that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, which means complete, thoroughly or thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Again, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All I can say in closing relative to the knowledge you need to have and to live by on anything that pertains to life and godliness, it's in the book divine. God has already anticipated every error that would ever come up and answered in the Bible. It's that complete. May we all learn and apply these truths to our lives in every realm, including both the religious, moral, and the political. If you're subject to the great call of Christ, in this lesson we study what one must do to become a Christian. If you haven't done that, you're outside of Christ. As a child of God, you must remain faithful as the Lord's added to his church, his family, his kingdom. But if you have slipped, if you have sinned, and then be honest with God in yourself and repent of that sin. Come confess again and let's pray with you and for you that God will forgive. Above all, let's make the right judgment. If you're subject to the call of Christ, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.